I think basically like this current period is like a, a cyclical disinflation, right? So basically we have two years of massive stimulus, large money supply growth, and then on lag, we had all the consumer prices growing up very quickly. Uh, and then now we have, you know, the Federal Reserve and other sort of banks coming in trying to tighten that partial withdrawal of fiscal stimulus as well. And so now we're seeing kind of the hangover of that whole time. We saw that last year, but now we're, I think we're continuing it so far, which is basically that we have various, you know, recession signals mounting, or at the very least economic deceleration and inflation coming off its highs. The caveat that some of the constraints for the supply side that trigger the inflation are still kind of lurking out there. And so if we have another round of growth, maybe, you know, 2024, 2025, I think some of those inflation pressures would be ready to return. Such a high ratio of utility to speculation. And so when you kind of look at other parts of the crypto ecosystem, they're very speculation heavy. Even when you bring it back to the Bitcoin ecosystem, when you have things like fiat on ramps and exchanges, you know, there's still going to be somewhat speculation based, less so, you know, some of it's saving, some of it's investing and speculating. But when you bring it all back to the Lightning Network, that's very, very utility focused. It's about payments, it's about infrastructure and things like that. And so I think that so far that the fact that it's been rather resilient is not that surprising. If you look back at, say, the 2008 crisis, for example, a lot of the companies that were growing that were later to become very big in the 2010s decade, a lot of them just kept growing from a small base through that difficult macro environment because it's, just the, it's the right product market fit. It's, you know, people are buying things that are obviously better than what came before them. And I think we're seeing kind of similar things, in some of the more utility focused aspects of the Bitcoin ecosystem, which certainly includes Lightning. So I I think a narrative that we're seeing is that, you know, during the whole kind of quote unquote Web3 thing that was happening, basically everything had a token associated with it. And basically that was just kind of like a lot of projects trying to get paid up front, whether or not the underlying project ends up delivering anything durable, basically fast. That's the way to, you know, ability to try to just everybody do seniorage. And what we're kind of seeing lately is the idea that a decentralized web is a good thing. It's just that you don't need a, a your own token attached to it. So we've seen, I mean, you mentioned Noster. There's also the whole Keat slash tags, you know, that vector. Yes. There's all, there's Web5, right? There's multiple different kind of angles here. And, uh, you know, we'll see how some fit together or compete with each other over time. But the point is, it's just basically showing that when there's actually a good product market fit, the product sells itself. You don't need to like add unnecessary gambling to it try to get out of the position quicker. You're actually building something of value. And then the fact that there's this common money associated with it also allows for monetization in the normal way. Kind of like if you invent like Uber app, you don't have to invent like another one with its own money, right? Dollars are dollars are fine or obviously, you know, lightning would be great. But like, basically, you don't need to like reinvent money every time you reinvent like a new service. And I think we're seeing that play out in the kind of the Bitcoin focused, you know, kind of decentralized web applications that have been getting some momentum lately. I guess I'll jump in. I th- so I see that view, but I think it's a somewhat frivolous position, right? So for example, all, all of us on this call, we have access to dollars. Uh, it's not really a problem for us. We can just do our normal day-to-day activities with dollars and then we can save and use Bitcoin in however way we want and it's fine with the volatility. Um, but a, a common thing that comes up when you look at these small communities that are building out around the world, these little Bitcoin communities, a common thing is that comes up is, hey, we need dollars too. And, you know, the ones that are doing it correctly, they acknowledge that their dollars are centralized. And the whole point is that the central hub is outside of their country. So, for example, let's say you're in Argentina, you know, I've seen it described as someone says, OK, I hold local currency for one month's worth of expenses. I hold, you know, stable coins for several months worth of kind of intermediate term savings. And if I want to put savings away for years, I put it into something like Bitcoin. Mm-hmm. Um, and for from the perspective of, say, an Argentinian, you know, they've had a history of if you put dollars in the bank, they get confiscated. It's hard to get dollars. And so instead of what they do is say, okay, I'll hold dollars. They're centralized, but the central hub is outside of Argentina, right? So unless the United States goes after it, or unless there's, you know, there's fraud, there's counterparty risk, those are real risks to be concerned about. But the central hub is outside of that particular country. And so there is so far been a pretty strong demand for dollars by a number of people in emerging markets in these spaces. And basically the technology allows them to move around faster and in a more peer-to-peer way. And so far they've kind of shifted around to different blockchains. So obviously they started on on top of Bitcoin. A lot of them migrated over to Ethereum. That's mostly used for trading, right? Because it's higher fees, uh, bigger amounts. Whereas a lot of the spending dollars moved over to Tron. 
And basically, a lot of these spaces say, okay, I want to have stable coins, but I don't really want like another token associated with it. I don't, you know, if I'm using a centralized stable coin, I don't need a whole another centralized layer to deal with. And there are different alternatives for how to do that. There's a Taro proposal, which is basically the idea of running them over, using the edge liquidity of the Lightning Network to run them over. There's also, you know, proposals like Peer Credit, which is basically using like a Lightning Light ledger. It's not actually on Lightning to move around those dollars. And we'll see what kind of market things end up winning. But I think it's clear that there is a demand out there for dollars, at least as an intermediate term thing, because, you know, not everybody can deal with, you know, 70, 80% drawdowns on 100% of the money that they're using. I actually think bottom up is more interesting, right? So all of the El Salvador experiments so far was spearheaded by Bitcoin Beach, which was a more grassroots kind of local high density rather than you know, trying to do a top-down thing. And obviously, I think legal tender is great because it takes away the transaction, like uh, taxes, uh, especially, uh, yeah, and things like that. So obviously, I would, I would like to see countries do that. Uh, but I think that you can't just wait for countries to, you know, acknowledge the interesting aspects of the network and then, you know, move forward with that. That's kind of a special case because they're already dollarized. There's not that many dollarized countries out there. But instead, I think what's interesting, you're, you're seeing like, you know, Bitcoin Lake, Bitcoin Island, you know, Bitcoin community pop up in Vietnam, for example. There's all these like small other replicants of Bitcoin Beach on somewhat smaller scales. And there's other companies coming out trying to spearhead more of those as well. Uh, and so I think those community approaches where you basically find a smaller, denser population of interest and make sure merchants actually know how to use it, make sure the people actually know how to use it, kind of build that critical mass in a smaller space. I think that's where things are going to come from. I'd rather see a thousand of those, each with you know thousands of people, compared to these top-down nation implementations. That then, you know, people then are like, "Well, what is this new money you're poising on us? What do we have to do?" And again, that's not even necessarily criticizing El Salvador. It's saying it really started from Bitcoin Beach, and I just think you need to see more of those, the smaller ones. And I think look there, and if you see a bunch, then be really successful in some of those countries. Then you might see much like El Salvador, you might see then a top-down acknowledgement of some of the work that's been going on there, and you might see some countries embrace that. And I, I really like the work that, for example, Gridless is doing. And I, I mentioned that in my, my latest update, my Bitcoin energy article, because there's all that untapped energy out there, right? So all these like small rivers and things like that. And it's actually really cool to see those, again, that's another example of a bottom-up community. And before I saw that example, if you asked me, what is going to come first, wallet, you know, these like communities built around wallets or mining, I would say probably the wallet ones. But I would love to see more and more of these mining communities pop up in places where it makes sense. Um, and it, it's kind of a more complete integration. And I remember reading uh, Ross Stevens' his 2020 shareholder letter, and he talked about Bitcoin quite heavily in it. And he talked about the idea of in the future, basically Bitcoin enables kind of like how human settlements happen around coasts and rivers. Mm -hmm. uh, Bitcoin is this unique consumer of energy that can go to where the energy is in a way that most other things can't. And then by extension, you can have settlements built around those uses of energy. And you can build out infrastructure from there. And he even mentioned that he, he thought in the future it'd be very hydro-based, talk about Africa. And it's kind of, it's actually really fascinating to go back and read what he wrote. You know, I think it was late 2020 to kind of, you know, go forward and see what, what kind of work is being done in Africa with gridless. It, it's essentially the vision he laid out. So I'm, I'm, I'm hopeful for it and I'm happy to see that kind of thing happening. The challenge with mining in general is that it's always trickier when you're going into to jurisdictions where there's less stable rule of law if you're doing something that's capital intensive. If you're doing something software oriented, it's a lower, you know, kind of just overall commitment. Whereas if you're doing something hardware focused, especially on a bigger scale, that's a challenge. And with, with, wow. With traditional miners, you have to go where the minerals are. You don't really have a choice. Uh, and a lot of those are in, in, in more challenging jurisdictions. Whereas with Bitcoin, you know, low cost energy, stranded energy is a pretty evenly distributed resource globally. There's a lot of pockets of it in very different types. But some of them, if they're capital intensive, they might say, well, we're not going to go there. It's too, it's too much hurdles, too much frictions. And I think the main way around that, it has to be bottom up. It has to be these smaller scale interested communities people doing it for the right reason. So I think that's the one spear they can kind of go through that kind of dilemma and start building it up. So it's one of those things where when I wrote my initial Bitcoin energy piece in 2021, 
I mentioned that idea because I you know Alex Gladstein was writing about that. I had read the Ross Stevens piece. I was just like, you know, this is something I would like to see Bitcoin miners as a way to bootstrap, you know, act as initial buyers of some of this useful clean energy. At when I wrote that, it was more of a hopeful statement. I was like, I'm not sure how quickly we'll see that, if we'll see it on, on a significant scale or not. And so certainly seeing what Gridless is doing, it's further advancing that vision. And so I, I think it's great to see, and I hope you see more of it in more places.